Yeah, yeah, yeah. Que no pare la fiesta. Tú estás de party. Woo! Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Woo! Terrific cone. San Diego. We back, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome me back. We're home. Back to another video with Swagglehoss. Did anything happen when I was gone? Did anything happen in the news cycle that we need to talk about? Actually, quite a lot. So I felt like it was very, very important to start our video journey back with this important story here in the comic book market today. Friend of the channel, fellow YouTuber, Bryce Comics, has got himself wrapped up in a little bit of controversy and I thought it might be kind of important to break it down here in the video, talk about what has happened with this particular Dell Auto cover, and then land the plane by reminding ourselves that publishers, frankly, don't really think too much about the comic book collector. But before I get into it, if you guys could drop me a like, comment, subscribe, if you're enjoying the content, help support the channel, doing those things, I appreciate it. But let's get into this video here today. Now, a little bit of housekeeping things. Obviously, uh, guys and girls, I was gone for quite a while here, traveling the country. I was at San Diego Comic-Con, did a, a video shoot in the middle of Missouri in St. Louis. Then I flew out to Terrificon. I'll have a lot of videos and coverage and dealer interviews and things like that coming in the next week or so. So it'll be a lot of content that we got to put together. But I thought it was important to talk about this story here today because it uh, involves somebody that we all know. And it is really interesting because it is multi-layered. I mean, this is something that has been sort of brewing up over the last couple of weeks and has kind of culminated with this sort of reused art situation. Now, if you guys happen to know about Bry's Comics, another great YouTuber, of course, I've had Bry on the channel many times before. Uh, I've been on his channel. I consider Bry a, you know, comic book friend of mine. So, you know, I might be a little bit biased in the situation, but I will try to be as objective uh, to this situation as I can be. And I will allow you guys to sort of decide who may or may not be uh, at fault here if there is somebody to say is at fault. But Bry's Comics had recently put together his amazing fantasy Bry Box of Mystery. Of course, we all know uh, mystery boxes. Bry put one together and he actually was able to get a retail variant cover with Gabriel Del Otto, who, if you guys don't know, Gabriel Del Otto is one of the uh, biggest modern artists in comic books today. He has some of the most desired modern variant artwork there is in the market. He got him to do this really, really incredible Spider-Man cover on Amazing Spider-Man number 26, which was a retail variant cover of the Death of Miss Marvel issue. So when Brian announced this, he said he was going to create 500 mystery boxes, all of which were going to contain one of these comic books graded. I believe the buy-in for the box was around $250 or $220 or something like that. And you see right here that he made 480 80 copies of what he called the regular cover with the trade dress of Amazing Spider-Man. This was the artwork right here. And then he did 20 copies of uh, no trade dress. So the virgin variant of this, he said that of those 500 copies, he was going to be keeping one of them for himself. So 499 mystery boxes were going to go out uh, to all of the people who participated. And the grand prize of these boxes, you know, it coupled with uh, all of those uh, variant covers was gonna be some of these keys you see right here. And yes, that includes an Amazing Fantasy 15 in a 1.0 grade, an ASM 1 in a 4.0, and a Giant Size X-Men 1 in a 9.0, uh, among some of the other great, you know, Spider-Man books you also see. So, you know, this was pretty uh, cool of an idea if you're into the mystery box thing. Uh, you know, my personal opinion is that, you know, I've never really been a fan of mystery boxes, at least not for my own personal collecting. But as far as grand prizes go for mystery boxes, this is about as good as you're ever going to get. So I can see the appeal of a lot of people wanting to do a buy into this, especially if you are somebody who actually just likes this Gabriel Del Auto art. As you can see right here, Bry had even advertised this as chance at the rarest Del Auto variant in history because again, there was only going to be 500 copies of this. And this is sort of where, you know, the first part of maybe you want to call it controversy starts to brew from the situation because if you guys happen to know, we've talked about this on the channel many times before, when you do a retail variant cover with Marvel, you have to print 3,000 copies. You cannot do less than 3,000 copies. So that sort of begs the question, well, how is Bry going to actually get 500 copies from you know Marvel Publishing 
if he you know has to do 3000 well he actually got 3000 copies done and then he partnered with CGC to have the other 2500 copies destroyed and this is the first little simmering of controversy that we start to get you know a lot of people out there don't have faith in you know sort of this uh manufactured scarcity situation uh, i've talked about how when BTC did their superman foil variants and CGC helped them destroy them so that they can only have 300 that i personally am not a fan of CGC having involvement in creating scarcity. To me, I think that they should be just making uh, grades for collectibles. I don't think that they should be in the collectible business. But again, I'm not the CEO of CGC. They can do whatever they want. So uh, CGC helped Bry destroy the other 2,500 copies. He kept the highest grades, some of which included some 9.9s and a 10.0 in a certain situation with the uh, uh, version that had the actual trade dress. So once again, you have CGC helping create manufactured scarcity. People are a little bit, you know, iffy about that. You're dealing in mystery boxes. People are a little iffy about mystery boxes. And to cap it all off, CGC is giving nine nines and ten O's for some of these copies. So that was the mystery box. Uh, shout out to Bry. He he put it out there. Uh, he sold out all of his boxes. People did their unboxings. Uh, he had transparency videos about the fact that he was actually including his AF-15 and things like that. I'm sure Bry 100% sent out uh, all of these grand prizes. I mean, he's got a YouTube channel. He has a brand. And if you calculate the numbers and you think about it, I mean, buying a 1.0 AF-15 uh, totally fits into the budget for Bry to be able to do this. In fact, he's going to do very, very well uh, due to the fact that he's sold out of the comic book. So it makes a lot of sense to do sort of these high-risk, high-reward mystery box plays. Now, we move on to phase two of the story. Everybody gets their mystery boxes. Everyone does their unboxings. Some people get, you know, the AF-15, or at least one person does. Some people get the other grand prizes. Some people get the Virgin copies, which, as you remember, there was 500 of these, and 20 of them were going to be the Virgin trade dresses, which, if you guys don't happen to know, that means that there's no ASM right there on the top of the book. Uh, actually, 19 people are going to get it, because Bry himself kept one of them. And as you can see right there, you know, once people started doing their unboxings, uh, these things started to hit the market on eBay, and one of them, an ASM CGC 98 with the Virgin, actually sold at auction with 60 bids for $5,559. Prior to that, we saw one go for $3,050, and I think even prior to that, somebody did a buy it now for $2,000. So uh, how is that a return on your investment if you buy into your mystery box for you know $250 or whatever the buy-in is, and then all of a sudden you can flip it instantly on eBay for $5,000? I mean, you did pretty well. And once again, you know the, the pot gets a little bit hotter with controversy here because everybody's wondering, well, what about the 2,500 extra copies? Where's the proof of destruction? How do we know that there's only 19 out there? And, you know, Bry went on in his video to talk about, you know, Gabriel Del Otto and his artwork and how desirable it is. And he talked about ASM 667, which if you guys happen to know, this particular book is basically the modern grail of all modern grails. Now, why is this book so valuable? Why is it so expensive? Well, the art is fantastic. And other than that, this is just a book that has, you know, gotten uh, notoriety throughout comic book collectors. It's just sort of a status symbol. People just like it at this point. And you can see that nine eights only have 24 on the census and the last sold was $37,000. So, you know, a lot of people thinking, you know, hey, if this book is as rare as it is and Bry put out a book that, you know, essentially is the same artist, a similar situation where, you know, it's got a very, very cool Spider-Man pose. Well, this book is even more rare than that. If I buy it for $5,000, maybe one day it'll be worth $30,000. And while I do think that it is possible that it could be that valuable one day, I don't think it is very, very probable. Because remember, the ASM 667 was an actual variant that Marvel published. This was not a retail variant. We are still kind of new in this retail variant space where we don't actually know if retail variants can hold the dollar amount that you know a lot of other uh, variant covers do in comic books because of the fact that you know retail variants are sort of the, you know they they're not canon sort so to speak to the publisher so you know for that reason you know culturally within the comic book space you know retail variants are just never going to be as you know known as that of the genuine retail variant covers that come from the publishers themselves so you know maybe a story like this 
like similar to sort of an acetate gate, you know, the book takes a life of its own. It becomes, you know, a mythic within context to comic book collectors and the prize comics variant can, you know, be infamous one day, similar to that of 667. But, you know, if you're somebody out there who was gambling on this, I, I don't actually know if it's going to be the same thing. Similarly, that was, that was the time 667 where there weren't as many comic book collectors. That was truly uh, rare due to the fact that People just didn't collect it. People just, you know, didn't buy it or didn't take care of it. So it has a natural organic scarcity to it, whereas the Sprite Comics one is coming out of the gate as a manufactured scarcity. Granted, all collectibles are manufactured scarcity, but you know what I mean. So that was now phase number two here to the story. And now we enter phase three, which is the, you know, craziest, juiciest, spiciest part of the story, where we came to find out that this cover that Brian had put on his retail variant had actually already been used 20 years ago uh, by Marvel Italy. This, as you can see, says right here, Spider-Man X 10th Anniversary Special, Marvel Italy Panini in 2004. You can see that it is the exact same cover art. I believe it was International Comics on Instagram who happened to realize that this Bryce Comics artwork was the same as one that was used, you know, two decades ago. And that became a huge controversy in the comic book market. A lot of people talking about that. A lot of people going, hey, what is the deal with this? Uh, this is reused art. Was this, you know, a scandal? Was this a scam? Was Did Brian know this? Uh, what is going on here? And this caused a big uproar in the comic book community, as it should, because we now have reused art on this very, very expensive cover that Bry used. Now, Bry has since come out and made statements on his Instagram just talking about that, you know, he didn't know that this was art uh, used from a long time ago. And I totally believe him in that situation. It would be hard to realize that this was a piece of artwork that was used in Italy. Uh, y even if you did a reverse image search, I don't necessarily know if it would be able to pop up. You know, even if you go onto eBay right now, I actually can't find that uh, special edition book on Italy. So it was a very, very obscure thing that Marvel used this for. And it would be hard for Brian to actually verify that it was used, you know, whatever, 20 years ago, unless you happen to, you know, own the, a copy of that book or live in in Italy or whatever the case may be. So Bry has said that, you know, he's getting word from Marvel Publishing. Now, I was at Terrificon, uh, like I was talking about earlier in the video, and I actually went around the show and talked to some of the retailers that have been doing exclusives, trying to understand like how this process actually works. And, you know, it was very, very surprising and eye-opening to hear uh, what retailers actually go through when they do some of this stuff. You would actually think that Bry would talk to Gabriel Del Otto and say, hey man, I wanna do a variant cover with you. Uh, let, I wanna do like a Spider-Man thing and they kind of go back and forth and they create it together and Gabriel Otto says like, hey, what do you think about this pose? And Brian goes, oh, I like that. Or oh, what if we, you know, add a little bit of webbing there? And it would be this, you know, collaboration and this teamwork between the retailer and the artist to create this cover. And then they would take it to Marvel Publishing to say, hey, here's the book that we want to print. Well, that is 100% not how it works. I mean, it can work in that situation in certain scenarios, but more often it actually goes something like, I, Swagglehaas, want to do a retail variant Swagglehaas cover, and I call Marvel and I say, hey, uh, is Gabriel Del Otto available for me to do a cover? I want to do a Spider-Man thing on this Spider-Man book. And they say, we'll get back to you. And then I you know, basically wait, and then maybe they'll say, yeah, uh, he'll do it uh, on this book. And maybe you have very, very little communication. Marvel Publishing is always the middleman between the situation. So I never actually talk to Gabriel Del Otto. In fact, in most cases, if it is somebody like Gabriel Del Otto, I just kind of get what I get. You know, he just sort of sends artwork to me and he says, here you go, uh, this is what we're gonna use. And then eventually the artwork comes back to me. They say, hey, Swagglehaas, this is what it's gonna be. Uh, here is your bill. And basically they just make me buy my own book back from, from Marvel Publishing. I never actually talk to Gabriel Del Otto. I never actually know how much you know he gets paid. I don't actually pay him. All I do is pay Marvel for the book. I buy it at whatever cost, retail cost or whatever. Uh, you know, depending on how many you do, if you do 3000, you know, it's going to be expensive, you know, it's going to be, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars or whatever the case is. And then I have to go out to market and basically, you know, flip my own book or sell my own book to, you know, whatever customers I can actually get. So that is really how it works. You know, there isn't this, you know, artistic, creative interaction in most situations. I mean, there can be sometimes if you are fortunate enough to know the artist and to have this collaboration, but in most instances, 
Uh, Marvel is the one that is doing all of the talking. Marvel is the one that is doing uh, the mediating. And really, you know, you never really pay the artist. You just pay Marvel for the book. So you don't actually know uh, what the commission rate is because a lot of people right now have been talking about, hey, you know, Bri, I hope you're made whole on this. Like that's messed up uh, because, you know, I hope you get your money back or whatever the case is. And then a lot of people in the other situation are saying, Bri and Gabriel Del Otto, like you guys colluded together, you know, you, you reuse your own art, uh, you know, how could you do this? So it's a really interesting situation and it's actually really hard to know who may be at fault here. And in my actual opinion, this actually falls mostly on Marvel Publishing because they should know if artwork has been used on other comic books before. I mean, is it possible that Marvel was like, oh, uh, Bri, you wanna do a Gabriel Del Auto cover? Okay, cool. And they go into like some database and they just look up, uh, what are the art pieces that, you know, uh, we've used here with Gabriel Del Auto? Or what are the art pieces that are just, you know, sort of in our Rolodex of art pieces? And they just randomly pick one, they send it to Bri and they go, hey, what about this one? What do you think about this? And maybe that's how it works. You know, if you allow me to just go to Speculation Town, as somebody who works in entertainment and has done a lot of contract work, and have has had you know situations where I work with a lot of different companies. It wouldn't surprise me if Gabriel Del Otto has some deal with Marvel, you know, some retainer thing where they just say, "Hey, uh, for this calendar year, you're going to owe us 30 deliverables, you know, 30 art piece deliverables." And he just has to turn them in, and then it's up to Marvel what they actually want to do with it. You know, some of them might fight, might wind up on comic book covers. Some of them may be, you know, key art for Marvel Unlimited on their website. Some of them may wind up, you know, uh, the cover of a, you know, new Spider-Man Miles Morales video game. You, you don't actually know. He just has a bunch of deliverables. They pay him one giant check, one giant fee. So he's never actually getting like a commission rate for this particular comic book. And I think that, you know, I would speculate that that's how most of the deals happen. But I would even push the speculation one step further. I can imagine a situation where, you know, maybe uh, he's only halfway done with his deliverables this year. And then Marvel Publishing calls up Gabriel Del Otto's agents and they say, hey, we'd like to cash in one of your deliverables now. We're, we're trying to do this uh, retail cover. Can you send us an art piece? And so, you know, his agents have to call Gabriel and say, hey man, we need you to uh, uh, turn around an art piece because uh, they're cashing in one of our deliverables. And maybe they just say, I don't know, uh, just use this one, you know, whatever. They just, the, the handler people, the agent people, they just have stuff on file. Gabriel Del Otto sends one over. Who actually knows? There's so many people in the middle of how this could have ended up in Bry's hands that we don't actually know uh, who was the one sort of reusing or recycling this art. But you know, for all we know, it could have been the handlers that gave it to Marvel Publishing and just said, hey, here you go, you can you can have them use this one. And that Marvel publishing person doesn't know what's happening internationally, especially things that are happening internationally 20 years ago, and they hand it over to Bry. And this is kind of what is really interesting about this situation because this is really only an issue due to the fact that this is for comic book collectors who put value and speculation value on modern comic books and rarity and variant covers and things like that. It doesn't actually matter to Marvel that somebody bought this cover for $5,000 on the secondary market. That's not their problem. That's not their concern. Maybe in their mind or in Gabriel Del Otto's mind, it's actually not an issue that this artwork was used on some random book 20 years ago in Italy and then also now being used on a comic book cover. I think a lot of collectors, you know, from our perspective, we think about this as a big issue, as a big scandal. But from their perspective, you know, what does it matter that it's reused on a cover or versus, you know, reused on some, you know, a billboard or some key art or some pajama pants? You know, does it actually really matter? I mean, I can imagine that they would not want to put, you know, art uh, twice on a comic book cover. But, you know, maybe to them, it doesn't matter because these are like two different things, you know, an Italy publishing thing versus, you know, a domestic comic book. So I think that this is something that, you know, we as comic book collectors, we overthink this stuff and we think a lot about the collector aspect, you know, the scarcity, the rarity, the print count. And, you know, sometimes we have to be humbly reminded that a lot of artists, a lot of uh, publishers, they don't think about this. They don't care about this stuff. And I'm not gonna say that they should or they have to. I mean, I think that they should because comic book collectors, you know, keep, you know, the publishing side of things uh, afloat. You know, I think uh, artists uh, make a lot going to comic book shows and getting autographs and things like that. So uh, they should care about it. 
But you know, generally speaking, for them, this is just a product. This is a, a deliverable. This is a thing that they just have to turn in, and it really isn't a big deal. Uh, whatever happens on the secondary market with a lot of their art and their artwork, and so that is where you can sort of see uh, why they would overlook a situation like this. But now we are in the situation that we are in. Bry is feeling it a little bit from the community. Obviously, uh, some people are upset about things. I mean, maybe there's some people who bought their mystery box that feel cheated due to the fact that they paid you know, $250 to get what they thought was the rarest Del Auto art, and they didn't actually get that. So I can understand if people feel upset about that. And it's gonna be up to Brian to figure out with Marvel uh, what they should do, where the communication breakdown happened, and you know what uh, he needs to do or what Marvel needs to do to ultimately make the situation right. And we will have to see what happens to this book in the future. It's a little bit of this year's acetate gate in that it affects all sort of uh, artists, publisher, and comic book collector all in one. So a lot of interesting developments with this. And I think I just sort of want to maybe end the video a little bit, uh, you know, giving just sort of my own thoughts on the situation. Uh, one of the things that I feel like for me is that when I found out how it actually works, how cold it is, you know, between, hey, we just want a, uh, you know, a Gabriel Del Auto cover, or we want a J. Scott Com Campbell cover, and knowing that the retailer doesn't actually you know, in a lot of situations have a lot of creative input. It's not actually a team. It's not actually a collaboration. Uh, that that sours it for me a little bit, to be honest. It, it, you know, in my opinion, uh, I, I'm not someone who personally collects a lot of, you know, modern variant stuff or retail variants. I like reading modern comic books, but I don't necessarily uh, go for the, you know, rare, scarce stuff as collectibles. Uh, but, you know, if I, if I was somebody who did that, you know, and I felt like I was buying a retailer cover who, you know, they're promoting that this is my book. Like I, I put my heart into this, you know, this is something that I created as somebody who has created his own comic book. You know, I would expect and I would, I would want to feel like there's some passion and there's some creativity that was put into this. You know, I don't want to just know that you phoned a friend or you just called and you, you, you know, you bought whatever. Oh, who, who's available? We're just going to get the Jenny Frisian one. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. All right, let's get that. And then now I'm just going to flip it to my customers. Uh, you know, that makes it feel just a, a little bit cheap, you know, to me. But that's just me. I know that's not every situation with retailers. I think there are a lot of retailers that put a lot of artistry and craft into the comic books. And I think that there are situations that it can work out. But I think for a lot of these big artists, uh, that is not always the case. Well, that is all for this video. That was me sort of breaking down the whole situation. What do you guys think about this, you know, current comic book situation? Obviously, retail variants uh, are actually something that haven't been that long, uh, you know, long lasting in the grand scheme of things. I think that retail variants are only, uh, correct me in the comments, have only lasted six, seven, eight years. I mean, it's a pretty new thing and we're still sort of figuring out, you know, what is uh, proper about it, you know, how, the right way to do it. What, do these books retain any value, you know, in the distant future? What will the value of this book be 20 years from now? You know, will it be an infamous thing? Are we creating the infamy right now by d talking about it and having YouTube videos about it? Or is this going to be something that eventually gets corrected by Marvel and, you know, they learn their lessons and then the book disappears? Well, that is all for this video. You know, again, uh, I, Bri, I consider him a, a good friend of the channel. In my opinion, I think that he was trying to do as best as he could with this. He was trying to create something really cool. I know him personally. I know he is passionate about, you know, the artwork and the variants and he's passionate about Gabriel Del Otto. He loves his artwork. And I think he just wanted to create something really cool. And I feel actually pretty bad for him that he thought that he was getting a chance chance to work with this artist and he got, you know, reused art for his book and he had to come out as the face of this product and talk about it. And you could see the excitement in all the videos that he did, uh, you know, getting the opportunity and the chance to create this book. And then he gave back these huge mega prizes to, you know, those lucky six people that won one of those, you know, AF-15s or whatever the case. So I think Brian is always trying to do, you know, good stuff for the community and create cool products. And uh, yeah, I feel bad for him that this happened. And hopefully, you know, the community uh, gets some resolution on this whole situation and that we hear, you know, something back from Marvel Publishing. Anyways, that's all I got for this video. Let me know what you guys think. Like, comment, subscribe. See y'all in the next video.